This little airplane has just dropped us off on this planet, which is not ours. Here we're like astronauts. We're at a location we can't reveal to preserve the integrity of its inhabitants, the Thoes. But now that the third millennium is beginning, we're going to tell you in every detail the life of the Thoes, a world we mustn't lose. In this inhabited jungle, the human voice is an ancestral melody, an open secret in a silent and forbidden territory. The people on this side of the Amazon are the authentic call of the wild. The cell phone fever hasn't reached here yet, but their need for communication is as important as ours, and with their calls they speak at a distance from the very belly of the jungle. It's 8 a.m., and one must go out to find food, as in any other part of the world. The heads of these families do so in groups, working together and mutually helping each other in order to turn the impossible into something possible. Hunting monkeys, the other inhabitants of the upper reaches. The makake that they are searching for are dwarfs that are invisible to our urban eyes, eyes incapable of looking beyond our belly buttons. But for them, aside from being visible, they constitute the hunter's basic diet. Fifteen people are participating today in this coral chase. Everyone has their place and duty. And it will be this way until death claims them. Because of its taste, the spider monkey, the largest primate of the Amazon ecosystem, is the animal that is most appreciated in this village. But today, many other different species cross their paths. The prego macaque and the guariba are also delicious. The soe call the latter the kiki, and they won't let it get away if they can help it. 
They're very active prey, and in order to catch them, it's important to immobilize them. That's precisely what they do with their streams of arrows, and also why they strike on the trees, making noise and confusing them, cutting off any possible escape. It's almost impossible to drive an arrow through one of these agile animals, but nonetheless, they try it over and over again. They don't give up. After two hours, the makake are tired and frightened, but convinced that the 50 meters that separate them from the ground will dissuade the hunters. But these poor monkeys are not familiar with the pride and the stubbornness of a young Amazon Indian boy. Various young men turn into ape men and elegantly, effortlessly, climb up the tree trunk all the way to the top in search of the animals. The village people admire them, and between all of them, it's as if they were telepathically pushing them on. After all, the feast depends on their success. They're armed and climb with the help of ropes tied to their feet. Whether from the tops of the trees or from the ground, the Thoe's marksmanship is an invincible adversary for the monkeys. Today, they would have preferred to defy the jaguar instead of the almighty Homo sapiens. Sooner or later, the large naked primate is always victorious. The hunter's sharp arrowheads have torn into the reddish bodies of these guaribas. In order to return home without foul odors, and also to keep the game from spoiling due to the midday heat, it's wise to remove its entrails and prepare it for the journey. We forget that our freezers are also full of corpses. Others do the slaughtering for us, and these are images that shouldn't trouble us. Everyone learns and everyone teaches here in this open air school where hunting skills combine with a fine ear for cuisine. This group of people has earned today's meal, and now is the time to enjoy it. The Thoe are the rulers of this corner of the earth. The beaten path is the hallway of their homes, and the trees, the pillars of their culture. Everything is at their disposal, and they, far from ignoring it, are one with the landscape. They too are the landscape. That's obvious to the observer. Without fire, there is no humanity. And today's monkeys are placed over it so that they cease to be just dead animals 
and become a refined meal through the precious art of cooking. Everything here is cooked. Water and fire in clay pots await the palate and the soul of the whole group. The Thoe love family meals and the after-dinner relaxation. This is not going to be a conventional film, an anthropological study in which gestures and actions are imitated. No, it's merely the results of two months of living together among human beings who know nothing of our world, of the other side of the shore, with no intentions of translating anything, but just enjoying their presence and sharing our passion for life, the same passion that they have felt for thousands of years in this unknown and hidden Amazon. We are talking about a community of barely 200 people according to our data, but a community capable of existing without harming nature, something that our society has forgotten. That fascinates us and makes them enviable. The Thoe have no need for us. They're happy, unhappy, depending on the day and the trials of each individual. They're humanly contradictory, and like other villages of the Amazon, have had to deal with accusations such as cannibalism, stemming from images like this one, in which an explorer or a missionary naively chose to see human flesh instead of monkey meat. Their everyday problems, like our own, have much to do with the kind of life they lead. Boy is hurt and angry today. Hunting is not an easy task. The jungle always takes its toll. He's returned to his home full of ticks, and his family hurries to attend him. A few of his children, and Toton and Yirosi, his wives, attack the four cardinal points of his well-formed anatomy. They love him, and they don't want him to suffer. Ouch, that hurts. These mites don't respect anything. As faithful nomads, the Thoe appreciate a home when the seasons permit them to create one. They construct their tapich, light but safe and comfortable, with wood and palm leaves. Various people with no strict family ties will live under this new roof. This house is being built by this elderly woman and her young husband, among others, but it will be ready this very afternoon to give shelter to friends and family members. The open architecture guarantees that no one will remain without a roof to protect them from the blistering sun. When did the first Thoe arrive here? How did they learn to interpret the landscape and make it their own? We'll never know nor will they. They live in Eden, surrounded by untouched nature, and their beliefs are also inspired by Mother Earth. They don't have a fixed God identified and idolized, but they do have animals and plants that are important to their spiritual lives. From the very small to the very big, all the actors of this great carnival of colors and forms are appreciated by these people who live in the heart of their mother jungle. Like all people, they also fear their demons. For example, the two-headed onsa, an abominable jaguar that smells awful and which they fear. When they smell its presence, they stop passing through the area for several months. In spite of surviving as hunters, death is not their only means of communication with the other inhabitants of the jungle. They hunt where and when the natural cycles allow them to do so, 
and they respect the breeding periods of their game, turning them into sacred periods when hunting is not permitted. Natural resources are limited, and they're aware of that. They never settle near rivers, whose banks are inhabited by supernatural beings such as this freshwater crab, which they call Wahau. It's the ruler of the subaquatic world, and they believe that with its powerful claws, it can destroy the head of any human being who dares to invade its domains. From our point of view, it looks delicious. It could be an exquisite dish, but a Thuay would never dare to eat it. A festive air takes over the calendar every now and then. The excuses are many, but just one is truly important, thanking life for so much happiness. With the fruit of the palm tree, acai and sapuke, a cake is made that everyone wants to get their hands on. Acai, and not petroleum, is the black gold in the Amazon. Now it's eaten like a homemade cake, using the nut of the sapuke for starch, another gem from this enormous fruit shop in which they live. Later, grandmothers, mothers, and granddaughters will use the juice left over from this refined sweet to prepare pidowa, a beverage reserved for special days, and that will serve its purpose after having fermented for several hours. <laughs> The party begins at dusk, and children and adults begin to dance in honor of the dead and of the earth that shelters them. It's the first time we see them holding casetes, rudimentary sticks that are used as deadly weapons in other parts of Brazil. These enormous men shouldn't frighten us, they're just sizing each other up. It's the men that make the ground tremble this afternoon, singing their yiyet, and the women that watch them, waiting to participate with their magic potions. There are no hallucinogenic drugs here. The Thoe do not frivolously drug themselves as do millions of people in our world. They get their euphoria simply from life, pure life injected into their veins. They drink pidua, and they diligently purge themselves without losing control. It's convenient to cleanse the body on the inside every once in a while, and this beverage is extremely efficient. They don't vomit because they're drunk, they do so because they are purifying themselves. The women and children will also do it, but apart from this celebration. Men sana incorpore sano, a rule that is strictly followed and one that will permit them to sing their chants throughout the night until dawn. <laughs> the name Thoe means we the Puturu tribe, the group of human beings who pierce their lower lips with an enormous wooden cylinder taken from the Puturu tree. They change this cylinder every 15 days, and they find them so attractive that they don't recognize themselves without this piece of wood decorating their face. When they're children, after all their baby teeth have fallen, their parents turn them into thoe decorating their children with what is the symbol of the tribe. At first they use small sticks and later larger ones, decorating their faces for the rest of their lives. The women as well as the men use the puturu, and they consider white men rather ugly without these facial decorations. 
They take exquisite care of this jewelry. It's an essential part of their beauty. And they wash it as often as they can, polishing it with sand from the river. They like this piece of wood to shine as if it were ivory, in spite of not being familiar with that material. And they also know that it's important to keep it clean in order to maintain good dental hygiene. They're not the same without it, and when they die, they're buried by their loved ones with their esteemed puturu, something more than an ornament, an authentic mark of their lineage. Birds are also important to their concept of beauty. This is the muton, a gallinaceous bird which is bred in the village and which is well appreciated by the females of the tribe. Of all its feathers, what fascinates them most is the beige of their down. And also that of this American vulture, the Urubu king, which they hunt exclusively so that they can dress up in the white gold of their feathers. With the patience of one who knows that good things are worth waiting for, this young girl chooses exclusively the most delicate feathers, ethereal like the flight of the vulture. A paste is made with resin, which they call huhut, which permits the perfect positioning of each feather. Little by little, she places the ireja, a hairband that distinguishes them from the men, and which all girls wear, especially after their first menstruation. It's a feathery ornament that stands out against the jet black hair which the Thoe women are so proud of, and which they continuously comb with the hunyua, a comb made of reeds. Sometimes, aside from the hairband, they wear a kumunja, a crest made of palm leaves that combines perfectly with a simple and cosmopolitan ponytail. If we didn't look closely at this young woman, we might think that her headdress is a cotton branch. But now we're familiar with its animal origin, although cotton is not unknown amongst the Thoi tribe. It's more a useful friend that they call Dijou. When the time comes, they gather it and spin it, just like our grandmothers used to. This group of women is making cotton thread, a material that is used, among other things, to fasten the arrowheads to the reeds. The Thoe tribe does not wear cotton clothing, but these young girls know how to sit without seeming immodest, in spite of their nudity. They always know how to behave in accordance with the tribal rules. We will never see a woman seated without covering her tuin. The men aren't completely naked either. Oh no. You've probably realized by now that this is a nudist program, but with nuances. This man is making one of those nuances. He's making a ruai, the sheet that the men cover their penis with. They only take it off to have sex, and of course, to urinate. But only in strict intimacy, no outsiders. After a few days among the Thoe, one feels at ease, happy to have gotten to know this cultured and socially sophisticated people, and also to have discovered their truly special commitment to nature. 
Here in this maloca, besides humans, there are pets, like this little monkey, which brightens the free time of its owner. Just in this maloca, there are 10 species, and there are many more in the whole village. Let's get to know them. This small makake wears a necklace made of the teeth of another less fortunate monkey. He's also a family member. There are others too sharing the food and table with the lady of the manor. It seems unusual that these great monkey hunters should pardon the lives of so many and shower them with affection. If an animal survives a hunt, it is automatically adopted as if it were another member of the family. The children here get an outstanding education in the subject of the environment. And they're responsible for the tasks of feeding and taking care of their pets. The house pets are varied and unusual. We've even seen vultures. This little girl has spent the afternoon chasing grasshoppers for her little bird. Tata is mischievous and is always getting in trouble in the village. Today his pranks are directed toward this pair of jacamines, who quickly defend their chick and put Tata and his friends on the run, an adventure that keeps them in shape and has them working out like athletes. Colorful macaws, coatis, and even tortoises in this zoo, which the Thoe don't know how to live without. Of all these animals, the various types of pigs are the animals that acquire a kind of transcendental dimension. These are the only animals that have an afterlife, something which the Thoe tribe firmly believes in. In addition to this, they sometimes accompany the hunters on their expeditions to protect them with their proverbial strength against the jaguar. If we had to choose one image, we would choose this one, a woman and her child in worlds of their own. Old women adopt small monkeys and surrender to this animal all that they once were. Tenderness for tenderness, a companion in old age, and who knows, if not in the afterlife. According to the oral tradition of the Thoe, who believe that the moon and the stars are the spirits of the dead who return each night to entertain the living, the world was once destroyed and recreated by a great flood. We're in the Amanuhu, the rainy season, and it does seem as if the land is on the verge of being washed away. But nothing here is destroyed, and the water turns into milk. Quality of life. Have you heard that expression somewhere? This child will be breastfed until he is three years old, and it's a glorious period that his brother hasn't forgotten. The mothers have a comfortable and efficient system to keep the restless boys from ending up in the fire or spoiling the meal.
Everybody is together, but not jumbled up. Everyone has their own place and time. They allow themselves to be tied up without protest, and the mothers can get a little rest. Their jungle is full of amazing places, and this is one of them. A desert in the middle of the Amazon forest. We finally get to see the outer layer of the forest. This is their favorite site for moments of leisure. The Thoe tribe does not come here to get away from stress. Fortunately, they don't know what that is. Many families just come to play and swim. Once again, they're in touch with nature. Their water bark is in the midst of a calm river. And their slides are of polished granite. There's no doubt about it, this is the society of well-being. They swim as well as their friends, the otters. And they enjoy these ruby-colored waters like no one else in the world. Parents and children relax in a secret pool aged by the millennia, pure. Crystal waters for uncontaminated people, for sweet people. Women, men, boys and girls demonstrate that it's possible to live in peace with this liquid world that we share as a common home. We return to the village grateful and silent. We don't want to break the silence just to be and exist. Ararat asks for me every afternoon. She's the most beautiful old woman I've ever seen. Defying the statistics that confirm lifespans, this 80-year-old body still demands massages and human warmth. As does mine, although I'm an alien from a world that ignores the elderly. Her daughter-in-law gives better massages than I do, but that's logical, she's a Thoe and they carefully practice this discipline, which they call bokikirik. She passes the pito, a cotton sachet daubed with chestnut oil and uruku, over every pore. It's not often when time can be so clearly photographed as today, as can the placidness that envelops this woman. Ararat knows well the meaning of life. She sometimes did the same thing for her grandmother, Sensuality knows no end, no time, nor dates. And the Thoe tribe exercises this at all hours of the day. From birth, they know what physical tenderness is, and even their sexual relationships go beyond social barriers. 
They practice simultaneous polygamy for both men and women. And in this hut lives a woman who has four husbands and a man with two wives. The initiation in sex through the first marriage is always with an older man or woman. For example, a 12-year-old girl may marry a 40-year-old man, or a 13-year-old boy may marry a 60-year-old woman. Their pharmacy is also close to their homes, in the forest. An ant specimen famous for its bite is going to be captured today specifically for that purpose. The formic acid that these ants inject is very painful, but it's also very good for rheumatism, as any chemist knows. The ants are furious, but they fulfilled their therapeutic function. Curiously enough, the name of this smiling woman full of welts is Tasi, or ant, just like her healers. Life goes on for the 184 people that we have chosen out of the six billion inhabitants of our planet. human beings with names that we invite you to learn. Boy, Murashin, Shehu, Shero, Tata, Toapa, Tohone, Cacheto, Quiero, Boku, Duramuranyet, Bonda, Quahi, Ararat. He's only three years old and he's already raring to go. He's a marksman and has style. It's in his blood. The Thoe's arrows are not poisoned. They're not familiar with curare or other types of poison used by other indigenous tribes of the Amazon. Their arrowheads are sharp, and so is their aim. That's the secret. They never lose an arrow if their aim is off. They manage to locate the arrow with their sense of hearing and simply retrieve it even if it's many meters away in the midst of this labyrinth of trees and shrubs. They cultivate a certain type of reed, muiwas, expressly for their arrows. High technology takes place in the huts where men and women contribute with their knowledge. They sharpen the arrowheads with a rodent's tooth, and each family decorates their arrows with a personal touch so that they can recognize them during a group hunt. Boy teaches this art to his children. With the urubu feathers, it will be an unstoppable projectile, straight and light. With a father like this, the pantry will always be full. The ceiling of the house is an ethnic armory. A large number of different types of arrows await to be used. Some are for land mammals, 
others are for monkeys. And there are even some with a turtle shell brill that are for birds. That way they can be killed without bloodshed and the feathers can be used. But what use is an arrow without a good bow? The baha is made of the wood of a tree that they can only identify when the tree is dead. The odor and color of the wood is unmistakable. This carpenter's brush is made out of the jaw of a wild boar that has to be sharpened every once in a while. And what use is a good bow without a tough bowstring? The curaba is the bromeliad from which this wonder is taken. This plant is related to the sisal, of unsurpassable elasticity and resistance, treated within the families in this industrial but natural way during centuries. The plant kingdom is once again useful and scoffs at our omnipresent plastics. Even our dental floss, which we thought we had invented, comes from this self-sufficient factory. Fishing is also done with the bow and arrow. Five hours away from the village, a stream and its inhabitants give way to the animal with the most creative brain in the world. They all withdraw. A number of men take turns mashing a grass rope that has toxic residues. Others make baskets that will be used to carry the fish back to the village. They know that they're going to have a good fishing day. After submerging the mortal load, the fish that were hidden until then begin to emerge due to the lack of oxygen. This is a poison that is effective for only a few minutes and leaves no tracks in the ecosystem. What happens next, once again, is sheer marksmanship. In this case, with very small and extremely precise bows, with more than sufficient results, exactly 70 fish with unpronounceable names are caught in one hour. The thoe need only a few minutes to become invisible. This ability is important when it comes to hunting down cutia, a fair-sized rodent that is known in all of South America for its delicious meat. The thoe know how to be patient, and in the end, the cutia and its keen sense of hearing all wind up in the pot. In addition to different types of game, our friends eat fish, as we've already seen, fruit, berries, and eggs. Also insects on occasion, and of course, the different types of seasonings that they cultivate, such as hot peppers, to which they're accustomed. They're unfamiliar with salt, and their beautiful bodies are a reflection of a balanced diet.
They're hunters, harvesters, and occasional farmers. Up to five types of wild cassava are produced on this farm. After carefully processing this plant, familiar to millions of stomachs throughout South America, they obtain a flour that is used for many different purposes. They press it so that it loses the chemical trap that's enclosed within it, the hydrocyanic acid, four drops of which can kill a human being. After having removed the danger and having been put on the fire on top of a clay grill, the miracle of bread once again occurs thanks to the cassava. The Thoe do not know what the sea is, but they are familiar with Duncan. <laughs> Their spoons are made out of monkey skulls, and their plates are made from the gourds that they also grow, all fit to enjoy the occasion until the day ends. To work up in the heights, there's nothing better than a scaffold. Ten meters from the ground, the skin of this tree is the best suited for the work they have to do. That's right, we said skin, and we're not mistaken, because these young men have come here specifically to skin a sheepie. Like cork oaks, these trees occasionally undress to serve man. With a stone mace called a yitak, they slowly separate the bark from the tree trunk. It's hard work, but an entire strip of shipi is well worth the effort. A number of men have worked today for something that only one of them will be able to enjoy. Today it's for you, tomorrow it's for me. Comfortable hammocks such as this one are made from that skin. This string is removed from the skin and turning it into balls of thread, this tree becomes functional. With skill, this Penelope, who waits for no one, puts her whole body in motion in a gymnastic exercise that will bring her great rewards. It's not an easy task to sleep well, and to do so a meter up from the ground is also dangerous. The hammock should be comfortable and light, and should inspire confidence. That's what this rope called kurana is for. Properly interlaced, this spider web will hold our weight with no weak points. Another domestic work of art. The time for manual labor is also the time for words. Nuhi, Tuhu, and Bonda give their neighbor a helping hand. She has four husbands with which she shares her affection and her hammock.
Meanwhile, Kuri, with her small child in her arms, seems to be remembering her pregnancy. As an earthy woman, she feels this to be just another happy episode, not a pathology to be afraid of. Until the very day they give birth, the Thawai women are very active, they're still nomads. Before their pregnancy, they control their menstruations to the point of having two menstruations in the same month, or none during four months, depending on their sexual appetite. For this purpose, they use the bark of a tree that only the women are familiar with, and they refuse to show the men this tree. We're not familiar with the abortion techniques amongst the Thawai women, but we are familiar with their family planning. This traveling village can't afford the luxury of unwanted pregnancies. The birth of a child is an event celebrated by this tribe, and the death of one is a mournful occasion. Tears are a private matter. Such pain is not expressed in public. They believe that if the father is witness to the birth, the child could lose its sight. Therefore, everything is in the hands of the elder women who act as midwives. In spite of this, Boy has not missed a second of the marvelous adventure of fatherhood. Next to the child's mother, today, he and the rest of his children celebrate his new child's first month in this world by dressing up as a woman. <laughs> nice baptism. All the men dress up as women and present a sincere tribute to femininity. Boy will walk around the village dressed like this for a few weeks, as manly as ever, but dressed as a woman. Once again, the color red is present, and a mixture of the uruku and oil anoints these fibrous bodies. Today they are banners, the banner of life and community, the color of the blood that joins them. The little newborn boy has also been crowned as a queen. At least during the following weeks, the two sexes will blend, ignoring the sexist differences and sharing the pride of belonging to the human species. We're approaching the end of this journey through the time machine. We've learned many things that can be summed up in one very important sentence. We are not alone in the world. It's curious to see that in this age of the internet and globalization, when we're searching for life on Mars and when the genetic code overwhelms us, human beings that live isolated on the edge of civilization still exist. There are no leaders among the Thuay. Men and women divide their pleasures equally, and between them, they equally share the responsibilities of daily life. They live in harmony with nature and can't conceive another way of being human. Together with other ethnic groups that we have no contact with, these are a people that have things to teach us, accurate answers to our eternal questions. They are the Thoe, the lovely people as we call them, because we love them. I'm honored to bear this improvised torch, the baton that a whole people has passed to me to hold thousands of kilometers from where they live, here, in my house, in downtown Madrid. I do so in the name of each and every member of the film crew who have lived unforgettable experiences with the Thoe. You've been able to enjoy an hour of television about a people who are probably unknown to your minds and your hearts. If it were up to us, this flame would never go out. 
It's the flame that symbolizes the culture of a living people, the Thoe. We haven't revealed to you what corner of the Amazon the Thoe live in, but without a doubt, believe me, the Thoe exist. Some white men are on the side of those that live in isolation. Some of them would give their lives for an indigenous world that needs them. We've been with them, and thanks to the affection that the Thoe people feel towards them, we've been able to film the episode that you've just seen. They're the civil servants of the Funai, the isolated Indian department. In our next episode, you'll meet their leader, Sidney Pozuelo, the voice of the jungle. We'll go over the highlights in the struggle for basic justice for the indigenous tribes of Brazil. It will be a program filmed from the trenches in which a man such as Pozuelo will tell us that the battle is not lost, but is still far from being won. There's been too much bloodshed in a modern country that doesn't have things very clear concerning the indigenous world. Sydney and his fight will be featured in our next episode because there are still thousands of indigenous people who are searching for their place in the Brazil of the third millennium.